Hi everyone, my name is uh, Bill Marzak, and I'm a student at UC Berkeley and ICSI. I'm also a research fellow at the Citizen Lab. And the title of my talk today is When Governments Hack Opponents, a Look at Actors in Technology. And this is joint work with John, Morgan, and Vern at, uh, at ICSI and Citizen Lab, and, and uh, yeah. All right, so this paper is kind of about uh, the topic of protecting individuals from nation state attacks. So this is in contrast to areas which have received uh, much more attention in the research community recently. Um, for example, the problem of protecting individuals from large scale attacks um, conducted by cyber criminals or institutions from nation state attacks, or in other words, APT. These have been uh, fairly, fairly well studied uh, recently. However, the, the the problem that I'm talking to you about today, indiv protecting individuals from nation state attacks has received comparatively little attention. So the paper and, and the talk that I'm gonna to give today uh, present kind of a first look at, at this space. And I'll be talking about the nature of these attacks, what, what we observed, what sort of technology was being used, the infrastructure uh, to conduct them, and all the while emphasizing the real impacts on real people. And the paper uh, looks at three Middle Eastern countries, and I'll talk about one today. Um, so the, the, the paper uh, talks about three countries in the Middle East, Syria, Bahrain, and the UAE, shown here on a map, um, and looks at various actors, governments, pro-government actors, cyber mercenary groups in these countries, um, the, the theme being attacks on political activists uh, in these countries. So just a bit of brief context before I jump into the research. Uh, so the, the Arab Spring started in the Middle East in 2011. Uh, in, in Syria, people were calling for the, the end of Bashar al-Assad's rule. In Bahrain, protesters took to the streets demanding greater uh, freedom and rights. And uh, the UAE was kind of an exception to this. There weren't any mass protests, but citizens were petitioning the government and agitating for, for greater rights. So as part of these protests, um, in 2011, protesters communicated and organized using what were the you know, hot tools at the time, right? Facebook, uh, Twitter, uh, social media. And in contrast with, with previous types of organizing and communication technologies, these are uh, encrypted by default in that um, the transport layer is encrypted. So, so if, for example, the government has a question, well, I wonder who's using, who's logging into this anonymous Twitter account, there's no way for them to, to determine that because everything's encrypted. Um, or if they want to see what activists are communicating about, how they're organizing, they likewise can't do this using a traditional wiretap-based model. Um, so all this has kind of spurred the look uh, or spurred a turn to uh, endpoint attacks rather than network-based attacks. And there's a, an industry, which I'll touch on later, which, which very much caters um, to, this, to this desire for endpoint attacks. You can see here uh, two snapshots of, of ads, companies selling products to governments to attack endpoints. The, the message being, you want to acquire the data that's on the device before uh, it's encrypted. So, our study is about three Middle Eastern countries, Syria, Bahrain, and UAE. I'll be talking to you about Bahrain today. So the question is, how did we, how did we communicate with these activists? How did we get in touch with them? How did we get the data for our study? So very much it was a case of the authors being acquainted with target communities. For example, um, I went to high school in Bahrain. I founded an uh, activist group, Bahrain Watch. Uh, and in other authors had, had connections with, with some of the other countries. Um, and some, some of our initial work very much helped us you know, gain trust and gain connections. This is an example or an instance of some of our early work in 2012 looking at this, these types of attacks which, which had good publicity, which further built, built up trust uh, and cred with the activist communities and enabled us to gain uh, better insight um, into, into these communities. Um, so what, what we basically did uh, is we asked um, groups in Bahrain, Syria, the UAE, activists, uh, trade unionists, uh, those, those kind of political targets, and uh, we had them forward any messages, emails, uh, tweets, Facebook messages, which they viewed as, as suspicious. Um, so this is, this is not necessarily a representative sample that we have here. We're, we're just endeavoring to present a first look at this, at this space. Um, so we don't claim that we have representative data here, but we certainly got some very interesting data. Um, so there's the, the amount of communications which we were able to, uh, the, the extent of our communications with these activists was around tens of thousands of messages. Uh, and we had you know, dozens of activists in, in these various countries and, and dozens of samples uh, that we found as well. Um, so this is a, a, a table here reproduced from the paper kind of showing the extent of, of the data of, of which our study is about. Um, so I'm going to begin uh, with an anecdote uh, which, we, which we were able to document um, in, in our paper. Um, so 
this, this story ran on Al Jazeera um, you know, around mid, mid last year, and this, the headline here is Bahrain student sentenced for insulting king. So this is about a university student um, who was actually sentenced to jail for one year, and he served one year in prison for allegedly insulting the king on Twitter. So he was accused of using uh, a Twitter account, uh, and we were able to actually get in contact with other people operating the Twitter account. It, it wasn't apparently just him, it was a, it was a group of people. And we were able to obtain uh, legal documents uh, from, from his case. Uh, so this is, this is essentially an order um, which uh, was relating to his account, a legal order. And uh, so I've translated some relevant bits here. It's in, it's in Arabic. Um, so this is an order to uncover the, the user of an IP address of, of this account, uh, Al Kawara News. It's an account that tweets like news about the, the protests in Bahrain. And the, the IP, um, so they're, they're requesting information about an IP at a specific date and time. And the IP here, we've just uh, redacted to not show the whole thing. Uh, and it's, it's a patelco, it's a residential ISP in Bahrain, and this is, this is signed by the, uh, the acting chief prosecutor um, uh, in, in the capital region in Bahrain. Um, so the question became, well, okay, how did they, they get this IP address at this specific time? Um, what we were able to establish, based on uh, our engagement with activists and messages that they forwarded us, is that the, the Facebook account that was linked to this Twitter account received uh, this message, um, and r the rough translation is, a, greetings, I'm a translator of the revolution, do you need translation of this? And there's a, there's a link attached there, um, you can see in the message. So this was sent from an account, Red Sky, which we were later able to establish is an activist, was an activist who was arrested uh, by the government, and the government apparently took over his account and was, was sending messages. So we, we investigated this link and we found that uh, it, the goo.gl link redirected to uh, iplogger.org and then ultimately redirected to um, a tweet. Uh, so the, the individual who clicked on this link and we were able to establish from the link statistics that there was one click uh, from Bahrain with the referrer of Facebook. Um, whoops. So we were able to establish um, that there was one click on the link uh, from a referrer of Facebook. And uh, it appears that this click uh, resulted in in this this individual's arrest. We we looked at the uh, the time that the link was created and the time of the click on the link, and there was around a 21 hour delta in between. Um, so it appears that this this was a case of an individual who suffered consequences um, by by this link that was sent out from an account uh, under the control of the government. Uh, so. In our paper, we document this as part of a larger uh, ecosystem of these attacks that go on, uh, IP, using these so-called IP logger, IP spy links. Uh, and so in red here, I've, I've highlighted uh, for, on a diagram in our paper the story or the, the workflow which I just showed to you. So there's the red sky um, is the arrested activist whose account was then compromised and then used to target um, this, this Al Kawara news account. Um, as you can see, you know, don't pay attention to the, the minutia of the diagram. If you're interested, you can read the paper for details. But this is just to give you a sense or a flavor of this, the scope and, and scale of what we found. Uh, and this is not, again, not all the attacks we found. It's just uh, some representative samples of these. Um, we also have, uh, we also document similar cases in the UAE uh, and Syria. Um, the interesting thing about Syria is, is the use of uh, cyber, uh, cyber militia groups where the government does not appear to be directly carrying out the attacks. Um, as was the case, in, as we found with the case was in Bahrain. Uh, so I'll, I'm going to now jump into another kind of case study of, of the type of social engineering which you might find in these, these sorts of attacks. Uh, so this is an email which was received by uh, a number of activists in Bahrain, including one of my friends. And the email appears to be, or purports to be, from Melissa Chan. You can see the, the from address there is melissa.aljazeera at gmail.com. Uh, so it, you know, they're trying to impersonate here uh, Melissa Chan. And there's an attachment uh, on the email uh, designed to be some sort of uh, re torture report or human rights report, content of interest uh, for, for political targeting. Um, the attachment uh, is uh, a RAR file there. So we, we extracted it, and uh, I guess you can't see the file names there. But, uh, yeah. okay. Ah, there we, oh, no. Okay. All right. So uh, the, the files, when rendered by Windows, uh, you can see they're, they're, uh, they appear to be JPG files, right? They've got the default Windows Vista image icon, and it looks like the extensions.jpg. Uh, however, this is actually an instance of what's known as the, the Unicode right-to-left override trick, um, where the file name is actually uh, gpj.bajr.exe, um, and the first character is a Unicode right-to-left uh, right uh, control character.
Um, so, so this was kind of a, an interesting, uh, clever technique they used. Um, so the question became, what was this attachment? What, what, what did it do? Um, you know, it was an exe file clearly, so there's probably something interesting. So we were able to analyze this um, and found that in, a, in the memory dump of an infected machine, or a machine where the executable had run, we found the string uh, finspy uh, in the memory. And it turns out that this, this, uh, this name FinSpy is, is, a, is a product, actually, um, from this industry, which I was alluding to before, catering to governments seeking to compromise endpoint devices. So FinSpy is, is um, the, by, this, by this company, FinFisher, and this is a, a snapshot from one of their demo or promo videos for the product. Um, and this is actually uh, part of a much larger, FinFisher is one company, part of a much larger industry of these companies, which are catering to law enforcement, providing uh, you know, support uh, or systems to law enforcement. And this is a snapshot of ISS World, which is the surveillance uh, conference, sometimes known as the wiretappers ball. Um, and companies congregate at these five or six venues across the world every year and show off their wares. Governments come visit, and there's you know, money exchanged occasionally. Um, so, these are some of the companies which you might find at one of these fairs. So FinFisher is one hacking team. I showed you their pictures earlier, and a number of other traditional defense contractors, and some you might not have heard of as well. Um, so the question became, all right, we had this, this sample, which, which was FinSpy. Now, what exactly did it do? Um, so the way we did this was we infected a machine and observed internet traffic uh, from the infected machine to the command and control server for the spyware. And uh, it turned out that they were using kind of a weak crypto for this. Uh, so we were able to um, break the crypto. They kind of uh, rolled their own as opposed to using um, you know, off-the-shelf libraries, which was uh, kind of an undergrad mistake, as some might say. Um, so in fact, they, they made a couple critical errors. They were, um, they were generating weak keys, so entropy, hey. Um, they were actually reading the system clock over and over to generate keys. And uh, yeah. <laughs> And uh, they also had a, a slight bug with uh, trailing plain text. So this is uh, you know, some keylogger traffic. I typed FinSpy on the keyboard, and you can see part of it's not encrypted because, uh, yeah. Anyway, um, so based on the analysis of this traffic, we were able to identify certain modules. Um, so this is a snapshot from actually leaked documentation from the product. Uh, it was just recently leaked. Uh, and uh, we were, this, this kind of shows the array of functionality that the spyware can have, and you can customize it as you know, a government attacker. Um, and by the way, this is sold exclusively to governments, uh, so the, the initial um, you know, suspicion was, hey, this is, this is the Bahrain government sending this. Um, so we were able to observe several different uh, modules in action. For example, uh, live recording of the microphone, uh, Skype recording, VoIP recording, uh, stealing passwords through forensics tools, um, screen and webcam recording, key logging, et cetera. Um, so th there's kind of a wide range of functionality here that, um, that, this, that this lets you do. Um, so the question became, all right, we found this instance of, of this spyware in Bahrain, and it's clearly interesting. It's used only by governments or sold only to governments. How can we uh, empirically characterize the scale of this, this, this usage of the spyware on a, on a global scale? Um, because clearly, Bahrain is not their only client. They must have, have other clients and, and uh, other interesting places, right? So uh, we basically undertook internet scanning using ZMAP, uh, Shodan, internet census data, and a, a wide variety of these uh, other, other types of scanning data which groups had generated. Um, and uh, the question was, um, how could we actually like find instances of servers in in these databases and showdown in the internet census could d did the finfisher server uh, the server for the spyware leave uh, a fingerprint which we could find and it turned out there there were a few um, perhaps the most bizarre of these at first was that the servers uh, when you tried to connect them on port 80 and send them an http request they returned the string hollow steffi um, which was quite distinctive and easy, easy to fingerprint. They also made a few later implementation errors uh, with regard to the use of UTC versus GMT and HTTP headers um, and badly impersonating Apache servers in a very distinctive way. Um, but kind of the, the, what they're doing now, which is, which is kind of interesting, we found, is that when you actually go to a, to a FinFisher server in your web browser, um, it'll bring up the, the web page for Google. Uh, so, you can see here, this is, uh, if, if you can read that, it's, that's actually not a Google IP in the address bar, but we're seeing Google on the, on the web browser. So the question is, well, okay, this is, this is kind of odd. Maybe we can fingerprint this, but hey, maybe, like, so we've got a search bar there. Like, can, we, can we do something with that, right? Uh, so what would be an interesting, interesting query uh, to, to put into that search box? Well, it turns out, if you search for the phrase my IP address, 
Google will uh, print a little thing that says your public IP address is blank, uh, learn more. So the interesting thing we noticed here is that the, the, um, the IP address in the address bar is different than the IP address that, that Google's telling us. So in the address bar, we have you know, some US uh, hosting provider. On the page, we have something in, in Indonesia. It's like an Indonesian ISP. So that's interesting, right? Um, so what's going on here? Well, ac according to this n other snapshot of leaked FinFisher documentation, they have uh, two parts to their command and control infrastructure. They have relay servers, and they have um, a master. Um, so what we believed that we were seeing was that the, the IP address which we found um, was indeed a relay, and then the IP address printed out by Google was, was a master. So it appears that there's, there's some sort of prox weird proxying thing going on. Presumably, they, they did this. They were like, hey, let's make it look like Google. No one will suspect that. Um, but, you know, some, some implementation problems with their uh, proxying technique here, uh, leaking some information. Uh, so we basically did these scans, uh, you know, global scans, and we found FinFisher servers in a number of interesting countries. Um, for example, uh, countries in the Middle East, um, Turkmenistan, fairly repressive places. Um, and we also did the same thing for another type of, of spyware uh, hacking team, uh, hacking team's RCS spyware, which is a competitor to uh, FinFisher's FinSpy product. Uh, so, okay, this is great. Where, where are we you know, going um, with, with this research, like what's, what's the next step? Um, well, so right now we're, we're undertaking uh, some initial uh, studies uh, to, to you know, basically get in contact with activists and find out um, to what extent they're, they're, they'd be vulnerable to these types of techniques and, and what do they need in terms of defensive tools. And then uh, looking also at new types of vectors and threats. For example, the, the new big uh, buzzword of the day is packet injection um, and not just uh, uh, adversaries like, for example, the NSA, which are, which are doing packet injection, but also these companies, uh, FinFisher and Hacking Team, sell systems which are capable of modifying you know, internet traffic to insert uh, exploits or, or other types of spyware. Um, so looking into to how, how we can defend or detect, detect those things, um, as well as uh, instances of, of uh, other instances of the spyware. Um, all right. Thank you very much for paying attention, and uh, I guess I, I'm allowed to take one uh, short question. Uh, so the question was, to what extent have these companies, Hacking Team and FinFisher, responded? Um, the most recent response I can recall from Hacking Team basically accused um, the researchers on, of this paper and others of trying to interfere with Hacking Team's legitimate business operations of selling these, the spyware. So they were, they're kind of, uh, initially the response was, was kind of more muted, but now it's, it's more antagonistic, I'd say.